Um, welcome to our very longly titled talk. Um, we have a more succinct title um, a few slides in, um, but we'll get to that. And so first of all, I'm Jay, and this is my colleague, Soren. And <clears throat> we're lead consultants at QBiz, and you might have seen our QBiz booth um, outside. And we each have, uh, each of us has about 25 plus years of experience doing data projects, and we've worn a lot of different hats. Um, we've been analysts, we've been engineers, architects, scientists, so we've kind of seen it from all different angles. And then these are some of the companies that, that we have worked at. So um, I know you didn't come here to hear about Cubiz, but my boss is sitting right over there, and so I have to talk about it. Um, so we do only data. Um, we don't do like front end or anything like that. And we're, we're a consulting firm. I should have mentioned that. Um, we work a lot with Airflow. Um, we also um, have partnered with Astronomer. Um, but we're not Airflow only. Um, and we, oh, um, sorry. And we, our business growth tends to be reference based. Um, we're a small consulting firm. And we often work with clients in a very kind of intimate boutique way. So this is what I call the real title of the presentation, which is <clears throat> A Tale of Two Orgs. And so this comes from, um, of course, A Tale of Two Cities. Um, maybe you're like me and you read this in grade school and don't remember it that well. Um, or maybe you haven't read it, but you're probably familiar with the phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I find in the data world, particularly around data science, that's um, kind of where we're at right now. It's, it's, the promise is incredible. And I think everyone is aware of the incredible promise. But sometimes companies have a hard time realizing that promise and bringing it to fruition. And so in that sense, it's also the worst of times. And don't want to alarm anyone with a guillotine up there. But I think we all know that um, <clears throat> companies don't have infinite patience for um, stuff that isn't working well. And, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, been talking for two days. Um, so how did the situation get so bad in, in, this, in the French Revolution? Well, as the title, A Tale of Two Cities, indicates, um, it's, um, there were kind of two, um, sorry, I'm getting really nervous. I'm not used to public speaking. So <laughs> please bear with me for a second. I'm going to take a little drink here and then <clears throat> and so you know it's a situation where people were not seeing eye to eye they weren't talking to each other they literally were inhabiting um, in effect what were two different cities and so in our tale of two orgs um, I'd say our two main characters are our data scientist and what I would call an ops and engineering person and the titles can change a little bit and what organizational structure they report into can change depending on what company you're in. But I find that these are two kind of archetypes or characters that, um, that emerge over and over again in this situation. And so our data scientist is interested in uh, rapid prototyping and experimentation. Uh, they need flexible individual data stores um, where they might not even know what data they need ahead of time. Uh, they tend to be motivated by upfront spend, which results in additive revenue down the line. And <clears throat> they're used to independent coding, so they might be working in IPython notebooks, um, say on their laptops. And the uh, ops and engineering person, they have to keep the lights on. They have to keep production running. They're interested in stability. They might also be interested in, or they might be responsible for company-wide data and metrics, the stuff that's reported out to the street or the board. They are interested in cost savings, more so than added revenue. And they are <clears throat> very used to collaborative coding. They're used to CI, CD, they're used to Git, they're used to pull reviews. And so often these, these two different orgs um, are at odds with each other. And so one thing we hear from scientists is we can't do our work, everything's so locked down. And Getting anything production takes forever, if it happens at all. And what we hear from the op side is, hey, we've got a site to run. We've got to keep the lights on. And we're responsible for the integrity of our key metrics. We can't just introduce new stuff in there. So one thing that I think is um, 
inherent in the notion of a revolution is some vision of utopia. And so what would a data utopia look like? So in my opinion, it's a world for the data scientist where they can freely build, iterate, and experiment. Um, they can automate their own pipelines. Uh, they can do min they, they only have to do minimal or no infrastructure coding, very little operational overhead, and they have a clear path to production. Again, one of the frustrations we hear from them a lot is that there just is no clear path to production. And <clears throat> from the other side, uh, Ops doesn't want the data science pipelines to interfere with the battle-tested company metrics. And it would be nice to have a place where idiosyncratic code, um, again, that's probably developed in IPython notebooks, could be modularized, tested, and promoted safely to production. So how do we start building this utopia? Well, ops and engineering, this is one thing we've seen work, is ops and engineering can build a um, what's essentially a self-service pipeline framework. And in this case, ops and engineering owns and controls the plumbing, and data science doesn't need to worry about any of that plumbing code. And <clears throat> of course, Airflow is the perfect thing for this. And that's because, as we all know, it has an open pipeline as code paradigm. Um, DAGs can be built dynamically from configurations. The configs can be YAML files. They can be JSON. They can live in Airflow variables. If, you've, if you were at the Bloomberg presentation, you saw an example of configs living in a database. And <clears throat> they contain, they, most, most importantly, they contain the, the, the meat of the stuff. They contain lists of tasks. They might contain SQL. They might have paths to Python modules. They might have dependencies between tasks or between DAGs. But the important point is they don't have any plumbing code in them. And so let's flesh this out a little bit more. Here are two characters again. We can imagine our data scientists working in a Jupyter notebook. And after the data scientist gets this template, uh, they can start working on separating out what's in the notebook into some Python modules, and then maybe populate the YAML file with references to those modules. And then <clears throat> at this point, our um, ops person is um, still responsible for all of the stuff that the data scientists leverage, like Spark. Uh, Snowflake, all the compute stuff, Databricks, AWS, Google Cloud, um, and where they meet in the middle is again in this script or DAG or something like that that takes these config files and actually turns it into a DAG. And that, again, uniquely enabled by Airflow. So some added benefits. Um, suddenly data science doesn't have to rely on an ops organization to get new data. Um, and they can also take advantage of, they're no longer confined to notebooks on their laptop or a single SageMaker instance. Um, <clears throat> they can also um, break stuff out in parallel that they had to run sequentially. It's, it's very hard, like in an IPython context, to run stuff in parallel. And from the ops um, and engineering side, there's lower operational overhead because Airflow gives us great insight into what's going on. To Let's us restart jobs. Um, it would be easy to hand something off to a, a support a support runbook. Um, the code becomes more modularized, modularized and testable, and therefore it becomes easier to quote unquote lift and shift to production. And now I'm going to hand it off to Soren, and he's going to talk about a pattern that we saw emerge at um, a previous client of ours that we found really useful and repeatable. Thanks, Jay. We have the clicker here as a clicker. So I'm going to recap some of the things uh, Jay just mentioned that's kind of in the order that we developed them at the, the client. So first of all, there needs to be an environment. So uh, ops engineering starts off the process by deploying Airflow, maybe creating some compute clusters, granting access uh, to services, and um, a good idea also of creating some some uh, cluster profiles to, to limit the resources requested by uh, the data scientists going forward. So the ops engine is also responsible for the template that data science should use and follow, and to create some sort of DAG builder that will render the YAML file from 
the YAML to a DAG. These artifacts are handed off to the data scientists and um, they build a DAG. Now this is an example of the four top level uh, categories that our client wanted to use and organize their code by. So let's walk through that a little bit. So the YAML file. The YAML file acts as a guide. It enforces some coding standards and it provides flexibility and uh, modularization, encourages it, you would say. Uh, this is an example of the module, uh, the YAML file. Um, it's got some met DAG metadata. Um, it has, uh, the code is broken into four major categories, feature engineering, testing, training, and inference, excuse me, and post-processing. Now, our client really didn't have a required section for data quality that should be in there, but that was more of an artifact that data quality wasn't consistent across the existing models already. So these artifacts are handed off to data science. The first thing they do is start moving the code from their notebooks into, or their scripts if they have them already, into uh, Python files and Python functions. These files uh, should be organized by the four major groups, feature engineering, training, inference, post-processing, et cetera. Next, we create the YAML file, which is basically the metadata of where this code can be found, what operators to use, what um, parameters to use, and, um, and the individual tasks, where the code be, can be found in reference to those. So then, data scientists take this YAML file, take the DAG build that they've been handed, and um, build a DAG. Now this is mostly for testing purposes. We don't intend for the data scientists to have access to the DAG builder so they can't be hacked. This is really just for a testing script to, to visualize the DAG, make sure all the dependencies are hooked up right, make sure it compiles. So by breaking up the code into tasks in order to run in Airflow, you get some, you know, for fortuitous byproducts. And the most important, I think, is modularization, because I think this is really the key to the success for the whole environment. So modular code use leads to reusability, right? Modular uh, code is easier for uh, sprint planning and reduces business risk. You can replace these modules piecemeal on a schedule that um, befits the business. And you can mix languages and services in the same DAG, right? You can have some code in Python. Uh, MLEs can come in and rewrite one of the modules in Scala or move it to another service like uh, BigQuery. And <clears throat> Most importantly, along those lines, it can be refactored piecemeal to reduce costs, improve accuracy, and um, to improve speed and reliability. So modular, again, data scientists, helps the data scientists. They can build reusable um, modules easier. Um, they can build ensemble models. So our client was interested in creating a planning model for an entire region. Uh, over quarter by quarter, they would add additional models per country to make an ensemble of many models. But this adds um, the flexibility to add those incrementally. Um, compute intensive tasks can be moved off onto a different queues full of uh, different, um, more powerful servers. And modular code is easier to test for better accuracy. And uh, I think really important for the success uh, for data scientists taking their own code to production is the use of task mapping. So I often see a lot of um, data science code uh, use loops, which of course, you know, they, they've analyzed some piece of data, have some block of code working well, and then need to repeat it over uh, different sets of data. 
the problem with loops is that uh, they execute sequentially. They're often, often features written in Python, which is uh, single processed. So for instance, at this client, they had 78 features that weren't part of their feature store that they needed to create that 78 serial tasks, which each one running about 40 seconds to a minute. But with task mapping, you can take the combinations of those, it was two nested loops, of those 78 uh, combinations of variables and um, put them in a list and execute them in parallel. So you now get 78 times, if you had 78 CPUs, the throughput. Now, of course, at the client, we didn't have uh, admin rights to the Airflow instance, and it was throttled by the 16 concurrent cats that can run at one time. So to get the data science code to scale is incredibly success, uh, important for the success of this platform and gives you uh, a longer timeline to, for MLEs or other uh, platform specialists to come in and tune the code for other uh, more scalable platforms. So just a summary, um, data science gets access to more resources. Um, their code might be able to go to production, uh, certainly can go to pre-production. Uh, they're off of notebook servers and more supportable by the organization as a whole. Um, moving code into um, Airflow actually encourages modularity because it's task-based. Um, um, engineering ops gets uh, to reduce costs because they're making use of auto-scaling clusters and not of notebooks that are running the whole time. Um, they get more time because it's self-serviced and um, they are forced to use standard templates across the uh, all sorts of all models. So this client had 30 models, all of which were organized into the feature engineering, training, inference, post-processing model. They varied under that, but it was easy for other data scientists or even other platform specialists to come in, find the code that they need to refactored and refactored it. And of course, beneficial to everyone um, is the sprint planning. I think being able to take a larger pipeline and not try to ingest it in one whole sprint or two sprints by breaking it up into smaller pieces that can exist. You can identify the problem tasks, target those which are issues, and um, maybe even leave some tasks that aren't so much issues uh, for a later date. Did we want to do our uh, short demo? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I'd just like to um, show what this can look like, just in case you haven't seen it before through the Airflow UI, because I think it's, it's pretty neat. And give me just a sec. have this all queued up, but of course I close the tab. I'll just mention within our presentation, there's uh, some more links to dynamic DAGs. That's sort of, there's two types of dynamic DAGs, the traditional using like a, a template YAML file or JSON file and the task mapping. Come on, come on internet, you can do it. Well, maybe it's not going to work that well. Anyway, it looks really cool. And one of the neat things is you can actually, there's a, um, you'll see a little square bracket for these dynamic tasks or dynamically mapped tasks. And when you click on that, you'll see um, the fanned out tasks listed one by one. And you can click on into those and you'll get, um, you'll get individual logs for each of those fanned out tasks. So it's super convenient way to, um, to see what's see what's going on when they're no oh, maybe I'll try clicking on one more thing okay I've lost faith in the Wi lost faith in the Wi-Fi um, and then we have 
we should mention it. Oh, there it goes. Once you give up just when it actually goes through. And so here's an example of one of these tasks. Click up on map tasks. And so here are five of those different fanned out tasks. And you can see each one has, has full logs um, separately. So it's kind of a magical experience. And so back to you, close that. Yeah, so I think we had our client, yeah. you know, we were able to reduce runtime using the data science, uh, pretty much original code from, I think, one process ran seven hours. We got it down to an hour. Another one uh, with 78 features taken an hour and 40 minutes. We got it down to about 10 minutes. And then um, we have a series of links to some great documentation provided by Astronomer and um, some other folks um, if anyone wants to explore this topic further because it's a it's a pretty big and nuanced topic um, and it's really powerful um, so thank you so do you provide data science with their own airflow instance and if so how do you kind of allow the engineers to maintain two airflow instances um, and like keep them in sync so their own native, whatever they're doing for their data ingestions and then the data science kind of pipelines. Well, you know, one th nice thing about um, the Astronomer platform is that it has a nice view where you can see all the different airflow deployments side by side. Um, so if you're using a hosted solution like that, that's one way of, of getting a good overview of it. Um, as far as keeping in sync, I haven't really seen a need to keep, um, say, engineering DAGs in sync with data science DAGs. And mostly I've seen Airflow for um, really there to, for, for the data science stuff to happen. Um, maybe a little more so than the internal engineering stuff. So Warren, did you? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So there's been a number of uh, talks about uh, local instances of Airflow. Uh, we tend to use Astronomer, or I tend to use Astronomer. Um, the, the guy from Coinbase did a very nice presentation on uh, local inflow, uh, Airflow instances that you can download. And so some of this, the testing that I was talking about earlier does um, happen on the developer's laptop or instance, right? So that their DAGs, at, at least at a development level, don't need to be kept in sync. And it's really just uh, to test the DAG build to make sure that the dependencies are set right. And then it pushes into a, a pre prod environment. OK. Yeah. How do you guys, uh, oh, sorry, first off, thank you for the presentation. How do you guys manage um, like cost resource constraints and cost constraints like with enabling data scientists to kind of do whatever they want? One of the biggest problems we see is people just go crazy and spin up instances. Like, do you guys have built in constraints into your YAMLs and stuff like that? Yeah, so there were a lot of details at the client that we left out. Um, the auto scaling clusters had a maximum limit, so they couldn't oversubscribe. Um, the computes, and um, again, there was another very uh, good presentation by Philip Gannon from Ast uh, Astronomer this week about uh, enforcing uh, cluster policies, which will actually rewrite people's DAGs or tasks if they oversubscribe uh, beyond what your administrators want to use. Okay, one more, yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, this might have actually been slightly covered by the previous question, um, but I was wondering if we could return to that YAML config template and discuss like the properties that were on it and how you ended up choosing those properties. Um, so the uh, could return it, but Hector was the um, it's working well I, I remember some of the properties I mean some of this is um, so this presentation is half reality and half what we want where we wanted to go and where we want to go um, the properties are the basic operators that the data scientists should have access to and so that's things like um, uh, SQL operators Python operators um, and whatever uh, ops engineering thinks they need, 
right? So that's where the, some of the constraints come in from the op side and their desire to control costs. Um, so then the template is really kind of based off what is required of those operators. So for instance, Python operators require arguments to be passed to them. So those arguments are a feature in the YAML file. And of course, dependencies, if you're going to mill a bag, you have to say this runs after that, and et cetera. OK, good. Thank you very much. <laughs>